Right, good evening everyone and thank you for joining us for the first in our series of webinars for GPs from OCL Vision. My name is Paulby Thompson and I'm the lead optometrist here. We hope that you find this series enjoyable and the learning useful in your day-to-day -day practice when seeing your patients. Just a few points, our webinars are recorded and they're available to watch on our YouTube channel, OCL Vision. This webinar is also CPD approved. The lecture will run for about 45 minutes with questions at the end. So if you do have any questions, please pop them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen throughout the lecture and we'll get, get to them at the end. So today's speaker is Mr. Ali Mirza. Ali is one of the UK's top eye surgeons. He is a director and founding partner of OCR Vision. He is also the clinical director of ophthalmology and lead consultant of pharmac surgeon at London's Imperial College Healthcare Trust. On that note, Ali, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Puri, and thank you for the opportunity uh, to present. I'm just going to share my screen. So I'm just going to get the slides up. There we go. Okay, so um, so the topic of tonight's talk is overview of cataract and refractive lens exchange. Pleasure to be here giving this talk to you all uh, today. Um, so basically, I'm going to talk about a couple of aspects, uh, a little bit about refreshment of anatomy. Then we're going to talk about different types of cataract. And then really from the GP perspective, what's relevant in terms of cataract surgery. Uh, a little bit about the surgery itself. I'm going to touch upon refractive lens exchange and why we do that. And then lastly, I'll finish up on new technology uh, related to types of replacement lenses we can now use. So just a bit of refresh of anatomy. This is a cross section of the eye. A is the cornea, the clear window at the front of the eye. The colored bit is the iris, that's uh, labeled C. And then you have the lens that sits behind the iris and that's labeled I. And that goes on to the vitreous J and then the back of the eye uh, further down. This is the lens and cross section, just showing the different parts of the lens. So you have the nucleus in the middle, surrounded by cortical lens fibers, and then you have the lens capsule surrounding that and suspensory ligaments, which support the lens uh, on either side. So if we look at what happens to an eye as we age, just dim the sun, if we go in. So what happens as we age is that the lens carries on growing throughout life and eventually it stiffens up in the mid forties. When that happens, we then have an issue with reading. So that's called presbyopia. The lens loses its focusing power and then you need reading glasses. Then as we age further, cataract development occurs, which essentially is clouding of the lens of the eye. And when that happens, that interferes with our vision and everything starts to become blurred. Uh, in terms of what a cataract is, so it's defined as any a pacification of the crystalline lens of the eye. There are basic types, uh, three main types, which include nucleosclerosis, where you get new layers of fiber compressing the lens nucleus. Cortical cataract, that's where you get new fibers added to the outside of the lens. And you get this characteristic cortical spoke pattern. Uh, and then there's a class called posterior subcapsular cataract, where you get opacities in the uh, back of the lens, quite close to the capsule, typically uh, occurring in younger patients and more associated with things like steroid use. So we go back to our cross-sectional diagram. So the nucleus sclerotic type cataract affects the middle, cortical affects this area here, and then your posterior subcapsular variety affects the back of the lens in a central area here. This is just a pictorial demonstration just showing what cortical cataract looks like. And uh, this is a posterior subcapsular here. You can see just the central area uh, at the back of the lens, which has a huge impact on vision as well as uh, increasing of symptoms like glare and halo. This is what a mature cataract looks like. So it's a white cataract. Sometimes you can see that through the, uh, the pupil and if the pupil is dilated, it becomes very apparent. In this type of cataract, the vision is often the level of count fingers or hand movements. What are the risk factors for cataracts? Or why do patients get cataracts? Well, if you live long enough, you will get a cataract. That's the, and that's the main risk factor uh, in terms of uh, what causes cataracts is increasing age. Most people will get cataract between the age of 60 and 80. Some people is a bit later, some people is a bit earlier, but if you live long enough, everybody eventually succumbs. Diabetes can increase the um, uh, 
the propensity for cataract, and sometimes you get it earlier if you're diabetic. If you've had trauma to the eye, that can also cause cataract. Uveitis is inflammation within the eye, and this can cause cataract in of itself or because of the treatment, which is steroid eye drops. Long-term steroid use, either by oral uh, dose or topical application, increases the risk for cataract, particularly the posterior subcapsular variety. Smoking, another reason to quit, that also causes cataracts as well as things like age-related macular degeneration. Ultraviolet exposure, there's a known association with, with that, so a lot of sunlight exposure without protection can increase your propensity to cataract formation. Uh, and then in terms of the genetic variety, there are some metabolic disorders that can cause uh, cataracts in younger age groups. You can also get congenital cataracts, uh, but they are uh, rare. So what are the clinical features? What do patients complain about? Uh, so the chief complaint is going to be gradual loss of vision. And the differential diagnosis here, is especially in the older age groups, is macular degeneration. Sometimes the macular degeneration, the visual, the visual loss can be quite sudden if it's of the wet type. Uh, with cataracts, it's typically gradual. So uh, because it's a slowly progressing thing, uh, it's a gradual reduction over time. And sometimes patients don't even notice it until they cover one eye uh, and then they realize, oh, I can't see out of the other one. Um, but it's actually something that's been brewing over time. Other features they may complain of, things like dazzle, glare, uh, monocular diplopia, as opposed to binocular diplopia. So if they cover one eye, they get double vision and they get that because light is scattered by the cataract, producing multiple images. Cataracts can sometimes induce uh, changes in prescription. So some people can become more myopic over time uh, and require frequent spectacle changes. So that's another giveaway sign that cataracts may be developing. In terms of the diagnosis, that can be confirmed via retroillumination uh, using a handheld ophthalmoscope or at the slit lamp if you have one. So this is just an example of what a cataract looks like with uh, retroillumination uh, against an ophthalmoscope light. In terms of the surgery, uh, what we do is we remove the lens and replace it with an intraocular implant. The standard operation in the UK is what's called phaco emulsification, which I'll come into in a bit more detail later. Uh, careful assessment of the preoperative eye allows for customization of the new lens. So it's not a one size fits all model. In terms of visual acuity, there is no absolute threshold of visual acuity at which surgery is indicated. So some people will be very symptomatic, even with a small degree of cataract, and others will leave it quite a while before they will undergo surgery. And there's quite a few psychological factors there, as well as occupational factors. So often a reasonable level of vision is the, the driving standard vision to go against in terms of uh, surgery. So if they drop below the driving standard, that's quite a good indicator to proceed to, to surgery. But some people will want it sooner because it affects them uh, in other ways. Uh, I'll come on to this uh, later on, the presbyopia correcting implants. Basically, those are implants that correct reading vision as well as distance vision. So let's look at things from the GP perspective. You have to consider when to refer, and then a little bit about preoperative assessment of patients, and then what to look out for in terms of postoperative complication. What may patients come to you complaining of and what needs to be seen? So when to refer, we've touched on this already, patient's vision reduced to a point where, the, where it's interfering with their lifestyle and needs. So you may get patients who go to the optician, they get seen, they get diagnosed with a cataract, and the optician says, okay, we need to refer you in for cataract surgery. And you're looking at the referral letter, oh, I better just refer this patient in. But it is worth checking with the patient whether they actually want surgery, because sometimes uh, they don't. They, they're coping uh, well at present. They don't like the idea of surgery and, and they're quite happy. If that's the case, you can leave it be and uh, you can make the referral when they reach the point where they're, they're happy to undergo a procedure. We do see some patients in hospital where they've been referred and actually they're, they're not interested in surgery. And we just confirmed the cataract diagnosis and then uh, discharge them again. So it is worth finding out whether it affects them day to day. So do check with the patient uh, in terms of their symptoms and check whether the patient is happy to proceed to surgery or not. In terms of preoperative issues to consider, there's only four. So there's preoperative investigations, uh, anticoagulants, diabetic control, and posture. So in terms of preoperative investigations, nothing really is required other than blood pressure and BM. And that's for the majority of patients. There's been good 
uh, analysis of data showing that uh, there's no adverse ocular or systemic outcomes uh, in the absence of doing a full preoperative assessment. It's not required in terms of a medical assessment. The only medical things that we need are good blood pressure control and basically the good diabetic control. Don't need to do any other tests. Don't need any blood tests either. In terms of anticoagulants, we don't tend to stop these uh, preoptively. Again, good evidence to show that it makes no difference. Um, we often get asked, do they need to stop aspirin? Do they need to stop warfarin? And the answer to this is no. Aspirin can continue safely. Warfarinized patients, as long as the INR is within their therapeutic range, whatever that may be, it's often, for example, three to four for heart valve patients, uh, maybe less for other things, but they can continue with their warfarin as long as their INR is within range. Uh, clopidogrel can also be continued. Most of the surgery we do now is on the topical anesthetic, so um, we don't use sharp needles around the eye. So again, the risk of problems is low. Let's talk about diabetes. So the diabetic control needs to be optimal for cataract surgery to be successful. If it's not, then the risks of things like cystoid macular edema, where you get fluid at the back of the eye, or endophthalmitis, which is an infection following cataract surgery, or progression of diabetic retinopathy is increased significantly if the diabetes is not controlled to a satisfactory level. So in terms of control, it's best to ensure tight control for at least a month pre and post surgery to get them through the danger period. And in general, just good control anyway to um, lower the risk of significant diabetic retinopathy. In terms of posture, we need these patients to lie flat for about 10 to 20 minutes. Uh, modern beds, trolleys can address posture problems in most patients. Um, there are problems with patients who have COAD, uh, Parkinson's and neck and back scoliosis. So uh, it is good for them to be optimally controlled as much as possible, given that we do most of these procedures on a local anesthetic. And if there's lots of movement, that can potentially affect the surgery. Post-operative issues, um, all patients are informed of RSVP, it's quite a good um, acronym. R standing for redness, S for sensitivity to light, V loss of vision, P for pain. So these are the main things to look out for following cataract surgery in terms of warning signs and whether patients need to be seen or not. In terms of what, what are the complications are likely to develop? So in the first week, uh, we're gonna watch out for infection, endophthalmitis, keratitis. Um, raised intraocular pressure is not common these days but can explain why patients may feel that there's an ache behind the eye. And then trauma is another thing we need to consider. So we always advise patients no heavy lifting, avoid eye rubbing, avoid straining, uh, especially in the first week of the surgery to prevent problems. Post-operative issues, complications in the first month. So usually uh, one of the common things that develops is local allergy to eye medication. So some people have a preservative allergy and if that happens, they will get irritation, redness. Uh, if they're already dry, the dry eye may become more symptomatic. And for those patients, what we do is we switch them to preservative-free medication, and that solves the problem. Imbalance of vision occurs when patients have cataract surgery who have very high prescriptions. So if they, for example, minus 10 in each eye and they have one eye done, there'll be one eye treated, uh, which have pretty good distance vision with the minimal prescription, and the other eye will remain as a minus 10. So there's a often a difficulty is called anisometropia, getting to grips with that. And the other eye will need to be doing, will need to be done fairly soon afterwards to uh, solve that. Other thing to look out for is foreign body sensation, things like a broken suture, although we rarely use sutures, and an epithelial defect. So if they've scratched their eye with an abrasion, uh, causing an abrasion. Uh, when a patient complains of reduced or altered vision, some of the things we think about in the first day or so is um, swelling from the surgery. So that can be quite normal. If the cataract was quite dense, we need quite a lot of power to remove it. So they'll have swelling in the cornea, which then affects their vision. If it's in the first week, you've got to think of endophthalmitis, which is an infection of the eye that's treated as an emergency. Uh, I'll come into that in a minute. Uh, and then first of four to six weeks, reduced vision, maybe do something called macular edema, cystoid macular edema, where you get fluid at the back of the eye, and that needs to be referred in uh, for management. Uh, the other thing the patients complain of is glare and halos. So 
that can occur depending on the type of intraocular lens used or whether sometimes swelling in the cornea can also have that effect. If it's after three months and they get a gradual reduction of vision, the main cause is something called posterior capsule opacification. And I'll come into that in a bit more detail in a moment. And that's easily treated with something called a YAG laser. Flashes and floaters always need to be considered. And if they do get those, particularly new floaters, we then need to think about a retinal detachment and they need a dilated retinal check to exclude that. So this is what endophthalmitis looks like. So the patient will come in with a pretty severe pain and they, you may see this level within the eyes this is called a hypopian where layers of, you've got layers of white blood cells settling. Uh, the cornea is often cloudy. There may be some fibrin in the anterior chamber and uh, the pupil can sometimes be variably dilated. Uh, the lids are also often swollen and there's marked uh, conjunctival redness. So that, that needs to be treated as a matter of urgency. What we do there is we will take a tap of the vitreous and then we inject antibiotics directly into the eye and that tends to solve the problem in most cases. However, if patients get this, the, the, there's a significant impact on their final visual outcome. Uh, thankfully, this is a rare occurrence, typically around one in a thousand, and, and even lower now with the use of int intracaramel antibiotics at the end of surgery. Intracaramel meaning antibiotics uh, injected into the eye at the end of the procedure. We talked about cystoid macular edema. This typically occurs around four to six weeks if it's going to occur. And this is where patients get fluid at the back of the eye, and that impacts on the vision. Oh, it can be, it's diagnosed with a retinal scan. So here are the fluid bubbles within the macula area. When we see this, we will give them a three month course of steroids and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory anti drops. And the majority resolve without any consequence to their vision. This is posterior capsule thickening. So when we do cataract surgery, we leave the lens capsule behind and that can thicken up over time. If it does, it can affect the vision as you see here. And this is easily treated with uh, something called a YAG laser, which we do in the clinic. This is what the YAG laser looks like. We just apply some laser pulses through this device at the lens capsule, and it's a five minute procedure, which solves the problem. What does routine surgery look like? Well, it's a day surgery procedure now, does not require fasting. Uh, patients can take all their medications on the morning of surgery as normal. We do advise no uh, eye makeup. There's no need for preoperative antibiotics. Uh, on the day, we give them dilating drops to prepare them for the surgery. Uh, for those patients who want it, we can give them mild sedation to um, just make them less anxious. In terms of anesthetic, the majority is now topical, so we just use eye drops. We can use what's called subtenons anesthesia, so that's uh, anesthetic that's applied to the layer underneath the conjunctiva, and that numbs the eye as well as the, the, uh, the muscles around the eye. So uh, it makes them a lot more comfortable. We use that when there are potential uh, reasons for the surgery to be prolonged. For example, they may need uh, the pupil dilated or it's a particularly dense cataract or the patient moving around and is unlikely to, to tolerate topical anesthesia. Peribulbar is when we use a needle around the eye and it's very rarely used now. And general anesthetic is a little bit of overkill for cataract surgery, but does have a place uh, for certain individuals. So patients have the surgery, 10 to 15 minutes, and then they're discharged home after one to two hours. In terms of the uh, requirements before the surgery, something called biometry. This is what we do to take the measurements required for the lenses, uh, the replacement lenses. Patient expectations are for everyone to increase, so this is quite an important aspect of the whole procedure. And with the increasing use of premium lenses, accuracy of the lens calculations has never been more critical. Uh, it's important to bear in mind, a lot of patients now coming for cataract surgery, all refractive lenses will have had previous laser refractive surgery in their youth, and we have to take that into account with the lens calculations. There's various devices that we use. This is the Zeiss IOL Master, and this is the LensStar from Hark Stripe, all very similar. I won't bore you with the technical specifications, but suffice to say, they look at all bits of the eye, the cornea, the anterior chamber depth, the lens thickness, the actual length, various other measurements, and we use detailed formula to calculate uh, what lenses are required. 
The big change with biometric measurements is this thing called the Hill RBF calculator. RBF stands for radial basis function. And essentially, it's the use of artificial intelligence to work out lens power. RBF algorithms are already used in facial recognition software, thumbprint security scanners, and in financial forecasting. And they're now being used for lens calculations. So just applies another layer of accuracy to our uh, lens calcs. Just give you, give you an idea of the type of the level of accuracy we can get. Um, this is on a review in 260,000 cases by Warren Hill, um, whose name is obviously in this uh, calculator. So he looked at these cases and found that only 6% of surgeons were getting an accuracy rate of 84%, within plus or minus half of target. And less than 1% were achieving 92%, within plus or minus a half. So the average accuracy rate was around 76 to 80%. However, when using the artificial intelligence model method, 95% were achieving plus or minus half accuracy. And that's 13 surgeons in eight different countries, looking at 3,212 cases. And you can see why this is now our standard method of lens calculation, certainly at OCR Vision. So the procedure in terms of what we do to remove the cataract, we need this thing called a FACO emulsifier and there's various different machine types. What it does, it basically, it's a tip that we can put through a small incision. This tip vibrates at 40,000 Hertz and allows us to break up the lens and remove it at the same time. Uh, so this is the schematic representation of what we do. Uh, step one, make an incision in the cornea. Step two, make an opening in the lens capsule. Step three, we remove the lens substance with ultrasound. Step four, we replace the lens with a artificial lens. And then step five, we ensure everything's watertight and inject antibiotic at the end of the case. And lenses all come in injectable format now, so we don't need big wounds. We very rarely need stitches now. Um, some people may ask, well, do you, do you do the surgery with laser? And the answer is, the standard method is uh, with phaco emulsification. We don't often use laser uh, with cataract surgery but we can use laser. And there is something called the femtosecond laser, which is used to assist in various steps of the, of the procedure. And I'll show you what that looks like uh, in a video. But in terms of accuracy, does it, does it increase accuracy? Uh, yes, it does. Do you get more consistency? Yes, you do. Is it better for premium lenses? Now, we're talking multifocal lenses. Arguably, yes. Does it offer any clinical advantage? And the answer to that is still uncertain in the literature. Uh, but some people do ask for it specifically, and some patients do prefer it, or some patients want to be done with laser. Um, but it is an expensive piece of technology, and not everyone has it. So what the laser does effectively is makes, makes automate certain bits of the procedure. So it makes a circular opening in the capsule. You can't get it more circular than a laser can do it. It also breaks the lens up into pieces in perfectly symmetrical uh, dimensions. This is just uh, some of the, uh, some of the uh, pictures that will denote how we can plan the surgery with the laser. You can also do your incisions uh, should you want. So here's a video just showing standard cataract surgery, uh, just the various steps. So here we're making some incisions into the cornea. Um, and then this is the opening of the lens capsule. So this is a manual approach. We then free the lens from the capsule using some fluid. This is ultrasound that we use to break the lens and suck it up at the same time. There's various methods of removing the lens. Uh, here we use what's called the chop method. And this ultrasound probe breaks the lens and then eats it all up at the same time. Once that's done, we then use a smaller device to remove any cortical material. The lens capsule is then ready for lens insertion. Here comes the new lens. So we basically pop it into the capsular bag and that's the end of the procedure once that's done. So we just hydrate the wound, insert a bit of antibiotic and that's the procedure completed. Um, let's go to the next slide. Uh, this is just the difference, just showing femtosecond laser assisted cataract surgery, what that looks like. So with the femtosecond 
laser. So I'm just going to pause it a second. So the laser has created already this perfect circular opening in the lens capsule and has also broken the lens into four quadrants uh, before we get to the eye. Here, I'm just removing the, the capsule. And you can see as a surgeon, it's quite appealing because you get a perfect circle, bang in the middle. Uh, we then go to a bit of hydrodissection, so we free up the lens from the capsule. And then here, we're using an ultrasound probe, same one to remove the those uh, previously created quadrants. When you do it with laser, you require less energy. This is now removing the cortical lens material. And eventually, we're just leaving the uh, the lens capsule behind, and then we're inserting the new lens. Here we're using something called the IC8 lens, which has a little pinhole within it, and we, we use this lens if the cornea is irregular, which is it is in this case. Um, let's talk about refractive lens exchange a little bit. So that's essentially the same procedure as cataract surgery, but that's done purely for refractive reasons, meaning it's done purely to get people out of their glasses. Um, in some cases, uh, we use it to improve symptoms, uh, like the case I showed you before, the irregular corneas. It's important to bear in mind that expectations are much higher in this group, They're usually done in the 50 plus age group, and it's usually done when laser vision correction is not an option, either because the prescription is too high or because they don't tolerate what's called blended vision, where one eye is set up for distance and the other eye is set up for near. A refractive lens exchange gives us the opportunity to use multifocal lenses. Um, let's talk a little bit about the lens options. So when we do lens surgery, we take out the natural lens and we, we have the options of replacing it uh, with some options. This is a monofocal lens. If you're putting in a monofocal lens, that will allow you to see at one distance. And it's usually, usually distance vision, but it can be near. Uh, if it's distance vision, you then need glasses to read. And here we have an example, patient sees well in the distance, but to read the paper, they need reading glasses. Then you have the multifocal lens variety. So that does distance and near using these rings within the lens. So in these patients, they can see near and see far, uh, as well as some intermediate vision, depending on the lens design. So in terms of the lens options, you've got your monofocal lenses, which you can set the patient up for distance or near. Uh, you can also do monovision, where one eye is set up for distance, one eye set up for near. Then you have your multifocal lens variety. So you've got what's called extended depth of focus lenses. And I'll, I'll go into a bit more detail about those shortly. You have bif bifocal lenses as well as trifocal lenses. Careful consideration as to the lifestyle and expectations of the patient need to be made. If we make the decisions correctly, and then the patients are very happy. Obviously, there is a compromise uh, in all these lens options that needs to be uh, imparted to the patient as part of the, the discussion before the surgery. All these lenses come in toric format. Toric means astigmatic correction. So you can get monofocal toric as well as multifocal toric. These lenses are aligned uh, once they're in the eye to correct any level of astigmatism. Astigmatism is where the eye should be like a rugby ball as opposed to a football. And these lenses can correct that as well these days. So let's talk about extended depth of focus lenses. What these do is they extend the focal point, allowing you a little bit more range of vision. Um, the bifocal lenses have a, a portion of the lens that does distance and a portion that does near. And then you've got your trifocal lenses, which do distance in the middle, intermediate and near vision using these ring patterns. So the trifocals, different companies do them. This is the Zeiss version. Uh, some exciting development in trifocal technology, the Johnson Johnson lens called the Synergy lens combines the uh, extended depth of focus lens with trifocal technologies. That gives you more of a natural range of vision uh, compared to current lens choices. So why use multifocals? Well, they increase spectacle freedom. Uh, patient population are much more demanding in general. Uh, we've talked about refractive lens exchange patients specifically. They, 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 they come to you to get out of glasses. Um, it's very useful for the right type of patient. And as long as the lens are customized accordingly, you end up with happy patients. There are certain varieties of patients you shouldn't use multifocal lenses on, for example, those with retinal problems or significant dry eye. They do have their problems and this needs to be imparted to the patient. So some uh, will get glare, halo and starburst at night. 
some people get blurry images at various distances. They don't work well with a poor ocular surface and there's low tolerance to small refractive errors, especially astigmatism. Anything greater than a diopter uh, don't work well with multifocals. So what's the latest development in lens technology? I suppose the main thing that's come about is this concept of the premium monofocal lens. So Johnson & Johnson have released something called the iHance lens. And what it does above and beyond the standard monofocal, it increases the level of intermediate vision. Um, and the beauty is it doesn't compromise visual quality. So they don't get the glare and halo uh, at night that a multi traditional multifocal gives you. So they get improved intermediate vision. They all get 2020 distance vision and the, their performance is similar to a standard monofocal lens. And they have a similar disc photopsia profile. So that means that they, they don't get glare and halo as opposed to a traditional multifocal. This is just a video depicting uh, how these lenses work. So that's your standard monofocal at the top. And the IHANS gives you a range of vision, which allows you to see uh, distance as well as some intermediate vision uh, without any visual compromise. Um, and it, it does this by having a refractive surface element, uh, which extends the, the range of vision. So, um, when these lenses are inserted, you get, uh, this is what a standard monofocal lens will give you. So you get the good distance, but you don't see anything here in intermediate. And when you have the IHANS lens, you get good distance with a nice range leading onto intermediate. So it seems a little, little bit more seamless, a little bit more natural. Um, so that's the advantage of these lenses. Um, Alcon have released the lens called the Vivity lens, which I've been involved with in a large uh, multinational trial. I was the chief investigator for this lens in the UK, and we did a whole series of NHS patients at Imperial. And similarly to the um, IHANS, it stretches the wavefront and provides very good distance and really good uh, intermediate vision. And essentially it extends the range of vision compared to a standard lens. And the visual disturbance profile like the IHANS is very similar to a standard monofocal. So it's very little to lose, but everything to gain with these lenses. So it's really exciting development uh, in lens technology. The premium monofocal lenses are our are, are standard lens in-house at OCL Vision. Um, patients gain significantly in terms of functional vision and very little to lose in terms of visual quality. So we offer this patients to those who are suitable and that's pretty much the majority of our, of our patient population. Important to get it right. So uh, got to choose the right lens for the right patients. This is all key and all part of the preoperative consultation. There are a lot of lenses out there and it's important to gauge what patients are after when they come and see us. So it's like, you know, what, what are you comfortable with? Do you want, are you happy wearing glasses? Do you want to wear glasses just for near? Do you want to wear glasses just for very near work? Do you want computer level vision? Do you want distance vision? Distance uh, vision? Do you want a bit of, bit of both? And then the question is, what are you prepared to compromise on? Are you prepared to get a little bit of glare and halo at night? If so, we can go for the trifocal. That gives you distance to immediate and near. If not, then we're looking at a premium monofocal type arrangement. And then there's a discussion about side effects and the, the risk of complications. Uh, so it's important to be candid there, especially those patients having refractive lens exchange. So these patients don't have cataracts. Their vision isn't compromised. They can carry on wearing glasses. Uh, but they've come for a consultation regarding the options. So it's important to say, well, you know, if you develop the complication, these are the likely outcomes. Cataract surgery, I mean, they already can't see to a significant level because of the cataract. So often these patients will undergo the surgery, but it's still important to give them a, an understanding of the risk involved. Important to let them know about the uh, potential of toric lenses. If they have astigmatism, we can correct that specifically. And then also, if we don't get it right, so, you know, with our lens calculations, we get it right 95 to 96% of the time now. But if not, there is the option of top-up laser fine-tuning to uh, correct anything if needed. And uh, some people can feel quite reassured that that's available. So again, so the important take-home message is that these lenses, yes, it's great to have the technology, um, but it's not a one-size-fits-all model. You do have to customize the lens for the patient and offer the patient the right type of lens. 
And if we get that correct, we have a happy patient and a happy surgeon. And I think I'll end it on that note. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ali. That was fantastic. We do have a few questions. And if anyone else would have has some questions, please do pop them in the Q&A box and we'll get through them. But Ali, the first one, you talked a little bit about technologies. Um, what technologies are available in the NHS and what isn't? Yeah, it's a great question. So at the moment, um, in terms of the technology we use to remove the cataract, we have the phaco emulsification within the NHS. We don't have access to the laser technology because it's really not cost effective from an NHS perspective. And then we go on to the, uh, the variety of lenses. So in terms of the lens variety at the moment, uh, most trusts offer monofocal lenses as their standard. Some trusts, and where I work at Imperial, also offer the ability for astigmatism correction. So we have access to toric uh, monofocal lenses, for example, at Imperial. Uh, however, some trusts don't have access to toric lenses. That very much depends on what the CCGs are prepared to fund uh, locally. Uh, we don't have any access to premium monofocals or multifocals within the NHS at the moment. I suspect, though, that as time goes on, the premium lens variety, premium monofocal variety, will end up becoming the standard of care within the NHS as well. It just depends. Um, I think there's a cost implication. They are a little bit more expensive than your monofocal lens, but they do provide patients with additional functionality in terms of the vision. So it would be good to have that as a entry level and the go-to lens within the NHS as well. There's very little to lose in terms of uh, compromise on vision. Uh, so there's not that much more you need to do in terms of counseling. And therefore it means you don't need to spend as much time in the preoperative consultation as you would, for example, in a with a multifocal lens. Uh, time, of course, is of the essence in the NHS. So one has to be wary of that kind of thing. Yeah, so the NHS... The standard lens is the monofocal lens, um, but some trusts, including ours, will offer uh, the toric lens variety. Thank you, Ali. Um, can you talk a little bit about the advantages and disadvantages of having surgery on the same day versus having it on different days? So that's another good question. So this is the, the are we so this is specifically related to bilateral cataract surgery or bilateral lens surgery versus separating them out uh, in time. So, I mean, there, there's been a lot of work done on this and in appropriate patients, uh, bilateral cataract surgery is uh, beneficial. Uh, there are a couple of caveats to that in that um, you have to think about the calculations beforehand. Uh, you've got to think about who's doing the surgery and the outcomes of that surgery and in terms of the levels of complications. So I would say if, it's a, if, it's a, if it's a consultant surgeon does the case, has seen the patient beforehand, has looked at the calculations, understands that particular patient's risk profile, and is doing the surgery himself, uh, and he has a low complication rate, then it kind of makes sense to do it. It then becomes a difficult, diff different conversation when you're dealing with, so for example, trainee surgeons in the NHS. Is it appropriate that a trainee does both eyes, given the inherent uh, you know, uh, increase in complication rate potentially, there's a whole lot of consideration to think about. And also on the NHS side, you've got different persons seeing the patient preoperatively, a different person doing the biometry and a different surgeon doing the surgery. So it's not joined up. There are potential uh, you know, falls or areas where we can slip in that pathway. So yes, it has advantages. Yes, it's great for a certain group of patients in certain environments, but one does have to be wary of the potential pitfalls and the potential for post-operative bilateral complications. They're phenomenally rare, uh, but they do happen. But there are certain steps you can put in place to minimize the risk. Thank you, Ali. Um, someone's asking a little bit, bit about the YAG. So you mentioned the posterior capsular opacification, where the back capsule gets a little bit cloudy. In what percentage of people do these happen? Does this happen and at what time frame? So it happens typically in around 5% of patients. Uh, the lens technology we have now has things within it to prevent a posterior capsular pacification. What they have is like a square edge, which reduces the incidence. It used to be quite high, in some cases up to 50%. Now it's down to around 5%. It, it typically occurs, I would say, 
from about six months onwards, if it's going to occur, um, most patients it's from a year onwards. Uh, sometimes we get patients five, six years down the line. So it's just important to be wary of as a diagnosis, especially amongst the GP population and amongst optometrists. So it is a reason why patients will come back and they'll say, well, look, my vision was great to begin with. Now it's not so good. What's going on, doctor? And the first thing is you know, actually, it's probably going to be thickening of the posterior capsule if they've had cataract surgery. It is easily treated. So we use the YAG laser and it's sorted in a five minute procedure. We give patients a short course of anti-inflammatory afterwards. And the vision typically goes back to where it was after their original cataract surgery. Thank you, Ali. Um, how about pain? Is there any pain after surgery? Very little pain after cataract surgery. So it's quite unusual, actually. There's a little bit of irritation on the day. Uh, that's to be expected. But once you pass day one, it's quite unusual to have significant pain. And that is one of the warning signs to look out for. So if you do get pain, it's important that we address it and understand why that is. So some of the key things are, is it infection going on? Is there associated redness? Is the vision down? Does the eye look abnormal? You know, and then low threshold for referral if there's pain. Thank you, Ali. I'm aware that we're reaching the 45 minute mark. So I'm gonna cut the questions short if, short, if that's okay. I am just going to launch a poll. So if everybody could just um, start filling in this poll, that would be fantastic. And for those of you that have asked, a CPD certificate will be sent to you. So I will get that over to you um, within the next week or so. I think somebody asked, will CPD certificate be issued? And that, that's what yes, I'm that's where I'm, I will get that emailed across within, within the next week. I do have that certificate for you. And whilst this is running, I am just going to, I'm just going to wait for this to end. And I'm just going to share my screen. If everybody can see, there's just a few final points, if that's okay. So we do have a online referral portal, which is safe, secure, and GDPR compliant. It can be found on our website at the footer of each page, www.oclvision.com, where there is a direct link, as you can see here, that takes you straight to the portal. It's a very simple portal in that you don't need to fill very much information if you don't really know what's going on. It's simply your details, the patient's details, and you can just click a condition and we will take care of the rest. So we will contact the patient, speak to them in detail about what's going on and arrange for them to come in and see us. Alternatively, you can provide us with extra notes and scans and upload them all via the portal if you would like to give us some more information. Just a, a screen here about our specialty. So as you know, we have Mr. Ali Mirza who as you know, is our laser eye surgeon and lens surgery specialist. And we also have Mr. Alan Barsam and Ramesh Anganwala who do the same things. We have glaucoma with Sally Amin. We have our, medical, our retinal team, which involves Chen Wong, Lorenzo Motta and Shah Kashani. And we also have Susan who does oculoplastics, including cosmetic surgery as well around the eyes. And that is all for today. So thank you so much for joining us, Ali. Thank you so much for today. It was fantastic. And we will see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you. Very good night.